Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Arwain aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lynn Tamande. Thread 1, Mad Investor Chaos and the Woman of Asmodeus. Episode 45. A tall woman garbed in casual dress for low nobility politely knocks on the library door and then steps inside. Sevar, if you'll follow me outside the Forbiddens, I'm your teleport for your afternoon appointment. Carissa gave this a bit of thought and decided she's just going to be truthful with Keltham that she's also spending some of her money on becoming prettier, probably with a playful, if you like that. She's not going to explain herself yet, though. She follows. Keltham is slightly confused about what sort of scheduling gap this implies. He can neither teach anything for which all students should be present, nor snuggle Carissa until she gets back, but gets tangled up in uncertainties about local interrogating someone you're also fuck-king relationship norms for long enough that he doesn't want to yell the question loud enough for it to reach Carissa, and then he doesn't remember the message cantrip for longer than that. Well, he has his own mounds of reading and learning to do. I'm also to retrieve a cursed bag of holding, the low noble says curtly once they're out of library earshot. She hands it over. How long will this be? The noble shrugs. Hour or two. Been a while since I had mine. She examines the bag. Used once. Emptied. Not recharged. Confirm or deny. Confirm. With a slight pang of regret, but she is not going to flirt with the queen. The noble tucks the bag away without comment and then strides swiftly in the direction of the nearest exit from the villa. Sevar will need to half-jog herself to keep up. The noble's legs are longer, and she's apparently stronger. Once they're outside the bounds of the physical villa and heading towards the edge of the Forbiddance, the noble speaks again. Not interested in the queen's affections, I take it. Understandable. That doesn't seem like a question with a safe answer. It's no flaw in the bag, which was lovely, or the queen, who was much lovelier. But terrifying to be around to the point where the prudent, wise, safe course of action seems to be ignoring her and hoping she stops paying attention to you. As I said, understandable. And yet one gets the sense the queen finds it annoying when people try to do the prudent, wise, safe course of action at her. It's a bit of a dilemma. I am hoping I can just make her powerful beyond all our imaginings and then be forgiven my confusion about how to handle it. This wins a snort of amused laughter from the low noble. A difficult tactic, but I would expect it to work if you can do it. The noblewoman puts her hand on Sevar's shoulder and casts a two-person teleport, sorcerously, not as a wizard spell. They're in Ostenso, outside a discreet but very upscale-looking shop. There's a sign in gold leaf over steel that reads Guillem and Arnau, and no other hint of what the shop does. If you don't already know, you're not supposed to be here. The noblewoman drops her hand. Different transport will be provided when you're done. I'm too busy to stick around here. Free advice, Savar, though I may suspect it may come too late. The queen may choose to request transcripts of your thoughts. If you thought about how the queen was very pretty but too scary for you to want to be around her, or if you considered using her bag again but decided against that only because you didn't want any more of her attention, she is liable to take that as flirting back. Of course, she is. The queen should of course have whatever information she likes in determining how to do exactly as she wishes, she says. It's not as bad as it sounds. She only does the statue thing very rarely and not to lovers who disappoint her in bed. In your personal case, I think you'd have to piss off the church and Asmodeus first before she'd go ahead with it. Carissa has absolutely no context with which to interpret any of the sounds coming out of this person's mouth at this point. Is she being reassured because she's thought to be an unhelpful amount of scared? But telling her the queen might come for her wouldn't seem to help with that. Is she being mocked? Probably. She's out of place here, in her world-wound uniform, and well aware that nobles tend to think that kind of thing is funny. Is there a deeper, secret message? Why would it matter what Carissa thinks about what the Queen thinks of her? Is she being told that if she's a shape that the Queen will think of as flirting back like it or not, she should actually just flirt back? But it's too late. The woman acknowledged it was too late. 
Is it a test of whether she internalized my lol's lesson about it not mattering what she wants? But even before that lesson, she was very clear on the fact that if the queen wants something, you say yes, no matter what it is and no matter how you feel about it. What's this person's angle? I have learned recently that apparently a lot of people have trouble looking forward to, with genuine delight, the process by which in hell they will be perfected. While I have many human deficiencies that make me an inadequate servant of our God, I don't have that one. And my problem here is not that it sounds bad, it's that I'm sure there are lots of equally interesting girls who are slightly less busy. Under no reasonable models of this person's goals was that a very good thing to say. The headband helps Carissa observe with perfect clarity. She'll just go inside, to her appointment. She didn't catch on this time. That's disappointing, but also kind of adorable. Abigail did have other things to do with her time today, it's just... When Seaver's thought transcripts show her thinking every five minutes about how terrified she is of you, it's hard to help yourself. About twenty minutes into her beauty appointment, which thankfully involves things being spread on her face and doesn't require much of even her unenhanced attention, it does occur to Carissa that nobles who are also Fifth Circle sorcerers don't run miscellaneous transportation errands security could handle. Doesn't she have a country to run? But that's not even a reasonable complaint, really, because everyone knows full well that this little project is the most important thing in it, and that this little project will succeed or fail on Carissa's judgment. And if it fails, then if she's lucky, she'll go to hell. Asmodea could not possibly be less relatable. Carissa finds herself, in fact, utterly furious with her, for having the thing Carissa wants more than anything else in the world, and trying, like a toddler too caught in the throes of a tantrum to be reasoned with, to rid herself of it. The only inheritance she has. The only good thing about being human. She does remember to ask if she can also be fitted for clothes appropriate to her hypothetical station. Gigaman Arnau does not provide that service. But there is a fine clothier two streets up if Madam Customer is sure she can afford their services. Or if this is part of a government operation, they can append a few words requesting clothing purchase assistance to the pickup request. Carissa has now gained a permanent plus one inherent bonus to comeliness. Yes, please, on appending it to the pickup request, she is sure she can't afford it. It's not incredibly obvious looking in the mirror. It's the difference between how one looks on a good day versus on a bad day. She could get away with not explaining it to Keltham, except for the policy of only telling lies they actually need. Also, she wants to keep doing it, so... She does not yet feel like she has understood the desires in herself that have no place in Axis, but... Well, yes, okay, she has... She wants to rewrite the Book of Asmodeia to have reasonable priorities and be grateful for her life... That's not a desire that has a place in Axis, but not the pride-related ones. Yet. Pickup arrives in the form of somebody who looks like a slightly tired, that is, not noticeably to anyone who isn't chelish, courtier who will escort Carissa to upscale clothing stores and buy clothing for her that a countess's heir should have. Actual teleport to follow. Theoretically, this decision gets made by Paraduke Retarion, but the person who received the initial message made a snap decision that his decision here was predictable enough to guess and be corrected if necessary. In an Asmodean tyranny, this is a bad thing to guess and be wrong about, but not insignificantly a good thing to guess and be right about. A countess's heir apparently would have a lot of clothes, more than are really feasible to own or wear or get from place to place, a countess's heir, of course, would have servants which would help on the feasibility front. Carissa is not sure how much agency she is supposed to exert about the clothes acquisition process, but she figures more countess's heirs err on the spoiled side than on the meek side, so she tries to make demands which go over fine. She wants fabrics that look like they'd be incredibly hard to do by machine because they're labor-intensive and sufficiently non-repeating, since Dathilan will probably find those more impressive. A lot of laces are satisfactory on that front. She thinks that Keltham will be unamused by anything that takes an hour to lace up, so those are out. 
She wants a dragonhide purse because Doth Elon won't have that, and she's tempted by necklaces that have tiny humanoid fey trapped inside them, pounding frantically at the crystal, but probably Keltham would get worried about them and ask if they want to be let out. This is just occurring to her. Do Countess's heirs who have a sadistic boyfriend have, she's not even sure what she's imagining, imaginative sex clothes of some kind? The obvious version would be, like, shirt sleeves that can lace together so as to bind your hands behind your back rather than lacing separately, or maybe there's a particularly spiky kind of lingerie? Fabric is so expensive that Carissa thinks of this as a fairly ridiculous indulgence, but now that she's thought of it, it seems like someone would have. Probably. The courtier doesn't blink. Yes, Ostenso has several shops for government-approved Asmodean subwear. Most, however, target sufficiently wealthy people buying subwear suitable for their pets and slaves. There's only one such shop that would be socially appropriate to a countess's heir purchasing subwear for herself, to wear of her own accord, and that one may already be closed or closing soon. Inconvenient. Can someone check whether it's in fact closed or closing soon? It'd be nice to bring Keltham back at least one thing from this shopping trip, because she is human and bad at the things humans are bad at. Carissa feels. What? Distress at the thought they'll assume she's just like this as a person? Their opinion of her does not matter, and if she were just like this as a person, then her life would be more convenient, and maybe she is just like this as a person, with the right handling which she just hasn't sought out. The embarrassment survives all these compelling counter-arguments. The courtier isn't much of a wizard and doesn't have extra message scrolls. They'd have to head there to look, but it's not that far. Sure. Carissa is not pathetic enough to let embarrassment influence her. She will go to the other shop. Knock. Someone opens the door. We're closing in 30, she begins, but then catches sight of Carissa's world-wound uniform and the tired-looking courtier next to her. We're always open for the church or the crown, she says a moment later. Good of you. I need something to wear. The intended audience is an innocent young man from a very lawful good country who is reconsidering what they taught him it's all right to do in bed. The courtier adds that this situation is not any higher priority than would be appropriate to a count's heiress shopping at this store. They are not to bring out anything or offer any services they wouldn't offer to a count's heiress. Strange and interesting on both counts, but the door answerer is certainly not arguing or asking any questions of this obvious intelligence operation. She'll quickly escort them to the relatively tamer sections of refined, noble Asmodian subwear. You probably want things labeled Perversion 15 through Perversion 20, she says. There are labels? There's a scale? But presumably what's interesting is both highly personal and incredibly contingent on past... whatever. Carissa will trust the system. What sorts of things have those labels? Perversion 15. Ballroom clothing suitable for a baroness not quite at the countess level. Elaborate, but nothing that would overly impede a dagger fight if you had to do that instead of dance. Cunning pleats and overlaps in the clothing would enable a lover to reach right through it for pleasure or punishment, in any number of various places and angles, without any need of removing it. Perversion 17. Loose slave garments and not cripplingly expensive to lose harem jewelry that would be suitable for a noble surrendering herself to a higher noble for sexual punishment after being defeated in a contest of wills and powers according to a not particularly legible etiquette code that absolutely does distinguish this case from the case of a noble who got physically captured by another noble and forcibly redecorated by them, in which case, obviously, you'd be shopping at one of the other stores instead, because this store is only for noble submissives who are doing their own shopping. It's not considered gauche or mockery to wear this clothing even if you're not really surrendering yourself to a higher noble and is instead a pleasing role-play or flattery, which makes it much more popular than the primary use case would suggest. Perversion 18. A simply enchanted cursed belt which prevents you or anything you're wearing or holding from touching your own genitals, used for preventing self-stimulation. It won't stop a mage hand, but it's at least a little difficult to get yourself off with a mage hand, 
It won't stand up to a dispel magic, and it doesn't have any indicators that would show a dispel magic had been used on it. That's more the sort of heavy-duty cursed equipment that a dominant would buy to use on a submissive. Perversion 18, also. A whole-body outfit of leather straps, concealing nothing of importance, studded with solid metal rings, any of which can be locked to any other. You'll need to also buy either these simple open-or-shut connectors, which you could just as easily manipulate to free yourself if your fingers weren't otherwise restrained, or these more time-consuming simple locks sharing a common key. You could be restrained and re-restrained in a very wide variety of positions using this, especially if you also buy these simply enchanted, adjustable-length metal bars with rings on either end. Uncaring use of this on you may require a cleric's attention afterwards. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Perversion 20. An Asmodean fighter's leather armor but interlaced through with subtle bands that can be tightened to reduce flexibility and resist motions, handicapping the wearer. If you were wearing this, you could lose a hand-to-hand -hand combat to a substantially less skilled fighter without it looking too unnatural. The groin protection can be detached without that affecting the restraining power of the rest of the armor. It's not that large a store floor, and even if Carissa keeps her focus relatively narrow, she's liable to notice, for example, a Perversion 24 enchanted metal bra whose breast cups go searingly hot any time you make a sound, a much more expensive Perversion 33 bra that sears you any time you disobey any order you hear, decorated aesthetic versions of many common torture implements that don't require overly expensive for a noble clerical attention afterwards, Slave rags, which sure look like ordinary slave rags, except for somehow being 400 times as expensive. Oh, they're enchanted to automatically clean themselves without requiring some random laundry wizard to use prestidigitation for two minutes. That's why they're 400 times as expensive, and of course cuffs, whips, branding irons, acid droppers, and blindfolds with extraneous gold detailing, and in some cases tiny rubies. In many cases, one can tell on a close examination that this is definitely subware that noble Asmodean submissives buy for themselves, rather than subware for Asmodean dominance to buy for their subs, because the subware is visibly designed in some way to allow or require the submissive to put herself into it, rather than for her to be restrained while somebody else puts subware on her. Obviously, this is a matter of fashion signals rather than practice. It's not like you couldn't threaten somebody into putting this stuff on. The male-focused section of the store floor is smaller, maybe a quarter of the size, but very much existent, for the benefit of that very, very rare Asmodean who wanders into a store like this one and starts pondering anything to do with gender disparities. Carissa has never really given a lot of thought to how the nobility lives, beyond deciding a decade ago she didn't want to be a court wizard because the mortality rate was appalling. Her plan was to start a magic shop, figure out who was the most important person to bribe, make them something beautiful every year for a present, and assume that's sufficient to keep her out of everything else. Her feeling now, looking at all of this, is faintly infuriated, it seems very fake, like they're playing the game of having sex instead of just having sex like normal people. Carissa is not actually sure she is very interested in the game of having sex. She tends to have sex for advantage, which means that when she's having sex, it's with people who have power over her, rather than people she has power over. But that's not a game. That's just how everyone's incentives are shaped. This is a game. The consequences are real, but the thing itself doesn't seem any less fake for that. She understands maybe what Mylal was trying to tell her, that it wasn't all right for Keltham to have her because she said it was. That comes from the same world as this, a world where everything is a game, where someone might decide to put on these clothes and seduce someone just because it's fun, playing with the inevitable natural order of the universe, but only that playing. Carissa is pretty sure that her actual sexuality, which she unfortunately needs to keep track of because there's no time in her schedule at present to learn to fake it, doesn't resemble this. It is about belonging to someone with the power to do whatever they like with you, yes, but it's not about belonging to them because you're into that. It's not about the fact power is sexy. It's just about power.
It feels like a real distinction, at least inside her head. Insofar as it features clothes like this at all, they were definitely picked for her by someone who likes her in them, not picked out herself. Okay, setting aside her actual sexuality, which being the product of a human mind is going to be stupid and incoherent, what does she want? Some of the fancy outfits that look like they definitely couldn't have been manufactured overnight as part of an elaborate effort to convince Keltham that masochism is a real thing, some things that look like they'd obviously only work with the cooperation of the wearer, some things for farther in, Project Corrupt Keltham, which don't as obviously only work with the cooperation of the wearer. She tries to model Keltham's reactions about magic chastity belts and... Keltham in her head is making a face, but not a no face, so she'll grab that. She has an unhappy feeling that somehow looking at the more dangerous stuff at all counts as flirting with her infernal magistrix. Because everything counts as flirting with her infernal magistrix, or at least everything done in the slightest awareness it might have effects on her infernal magistrix. Anyway, pushing Keltham too far too fast might make him decide to think too hard about the whole situation, so she won't get any of that. Yet. I think this is enough for now, she says once she's picked out an outfit for ballroom dancing, which she does not do while sexually accessible, which pants work fine for, and the magic chastity belt. Unless you're apprised of the whole situation enough to have opinions and advise otherwise. It's hard to figure out which possible responses to that potentially get her hand burned off in a way that non-government employees don't get free healing for. She's obviously not apprised of the whole situation, which suggests that she definitely shouldn't say anything, but that's too obvious to be the meaning. I have no experience or training in honeypot operations targeting unsuspecting lawful good targets. Government-approved literature has seemed to suggest that presenting yourself to a lawful good man in obviously self-applied bondage, gesturing at the outfit of leather straps, will tempt him to do things to your helpless form without that seeming to hurry him along the path to inflicting pain, and that tickling is useful as an intermediate step towards getting him to hurt you, gesturing at a shelf of tickling implements and lubricants labeled Perversion 3, but I don't know if any of that's meant to be useful advice or a fictional conceit. Realistically, shouldn't this be asked of a honeypot operator with experience targeting the boy's home country? But there's presumably some reason they aren't doing that, and instead asking her and also aren't giving her any more information. Citing only government-approved advice is the only tactic she can think of for possibly getting out of this with mostly inexpensive injuries. Oh, for fuck's sake, Carissa would just like people to say things if they think she should actually know them and not otherwise. You know, people say that the world wound is bad for Cheliacs because of how most of the national wealth is going towards fighting an endless horde of demons, but she's starting to wonder if it's actually good for Cheliacs because it's a place where if you waste too much time or play too many games you get eaten, which both winnows out idiots and is character promoting for everyone else. Great, she says shortly. How much for this, then? 40 GP for everything else and 340 GP for the Cursed Belt of No Touch. It would be more if it was an adventure-grade cursed item and not a bedroom-grade one. She glances over at the courtier in case she has opinions about whether Carissa is allowed to spend that much on sex toys. The courtier continues to feel nervous about correcting Carissa Savar in any way, even when she is seeking guidance let alone having any opinions on what Carissa Savar is allowed to do, but has nonetheless been instructed to make sure Savar doesn't make any accidental purchases she shouldn't, so the Countess's heir could own a small handful of sex toys costing that much, but wouldn't own dozens of them. This mission hasn't run out of gold yet, though they're getting close to the amount the courtier has on her. These both seem like very safe opinions to express and not ones that will cause Carissa Sever or Rathus Retarion or Aspexia Rugaton or a suddenly appearing pit fiend to kill her. This background anxiety doesn't show at all to Carissa the courtier is experienced. Carissa is not very interested in people's internal states as long as it doesn't cause them to waste her time or not tell her things. Great, then, let's get these and then swing back to the other store for one normal outfit, and they can take my measurements so I don't have to leave for future orders. 
If Asmodeus has taken a personal interest in that event happening, the courtier isn't going to argue with it. The items go into a standard military-issued common-use bag of holding. Back to other clothing stores. Carissa will get one nice dress that isn't a special sex dress and an undergarment for it, and not ask anyone any questions they are too nervous to usefully answer, and get all her measurements so that she can order future dresses that are even better fitted, and then she can be done with this ordeal and hopefully not have missed dinner. Judging by the time, she probably missed dinner. Keltham has acquired a timepiece that he will someday remember to check again. He's found out that Cheliax is 85% farmers, implying that their food per person gain function is 7-6, approximately 1-17, in which case anything that produced a permanent 1 or 7 decrease in farming productivity would cause human life in Cheliax to stop existing. There maybe shouldn't be all that many priorities higher than increasing the food per person gain on farming to something more like, say, 100, or at least 10. Dinner probably happened at some point. He isn't really focusing on that. Keltham is currently experimenting with prestidigitation to see if he can prestidigitate things to be magnetic, magnetizable, or to have rotating magnetic fields inside them. How's that going for him? Making random objects magnetic? No. Magnetizing a metal in the fashion you could also do with a strong magnet? Yes. Rotating magnetic fields? He can't make it a persistent property of the object, but he can do it very briefly, scattering a bunch of iron filings in a suggestive fashion before it stops quite working. Maritzel points out that if there were a permanent one-seventh decrease in farming productivity, all the least productive farmers would starve. But there is variance, and some farmers are very productive and would be fine. What makes some farmers more productive? Any clues? Can he make a loop of metal superconducting with prestidigitation and then use this bit of iron he already magnetized to start an electric current flowing which will then persist? Keltham has a detailed qualitative physics mental model of both conductivity and superconductivity, if that counts for anything. He wouldn't know exact numbers on how conductive a piece of impure iron would already be. Some places the soil is much richer, so plants grow better, says Tanya. And near rivers, it's possible to irrigate the fields. Getting an electric current flowing isn't working, and it's not totally clear why. Fascinating. If you can make something taste even vaguely like chocolate, you'd think you could make it support a superfluid of phonon-coupled paired electrons. That's much less complicated than the implied fitting of taste receptor potentially nergy surfaces going on with tastes vaguely like chocolate. Can he make something just exhibit the magnetic field expulsing effect? so that it will float above a magnet, even if it's not a superconductor? The classic science maniac Verez maneuver would be to see if you can use prestidigitation to turn a very tiny amount of something into antimatter, but that, obviously, Keltham is not going to talk about, or try until he's got a much better grasp on safety precautions. Yep, very briefly again, like with a magnetic field. And then he loses it and has to start again. Then Keltham is going to practice this some more, because if he gets magnetic field expulsion and magnetism both working, and if he's right about how things look to detect magic, he's going to be able to show off an object floating above another object without any visible magical force holding it up, which should make a nice, difficult-seeming impressive trick for Galarian natives if they don't already have any obvious ways for doing that. Carissa comes quietly in while he's still getting this down, having swung by Miles to ask calmly for confirmation that was, again, her infernal magistrix. Keltham wasn't at the stage of being ready to attempt a visible, thing-floating-above-thing effect, just bringing prestidigitated objects closer together to see if he can maintain the repulsive force he's aiming for, and especially while he's not actively casting the prestidigitation spell. This is good because he doesn't need to hide the preliminary stages of a difficult-seeming impressive trick from Carissa, who might otherwise be impressed by the completed form. Oh, hey, Keltham starts to say when Carissa steps in. She's dressed nicer and more normally, though not in anything like a Doth Ilani style. Oh, did you get back your non-world wound wardrobe and stuff? That's a sensible thing for the trip to have been about. Yes, well, acquired a non-world wound wardrobe. I haven't had one in mothballs for the last six years. Also acquired some other things I'll tell you about later. 
not bad for a low-tech society. He'd visualized non-governance clothing as being much cruder, given the description of hand-powered spinning and weaving. Wait, is that actually incredibly expensive stuff that only third-circle wizards on important government projects can afford? He'll quietly ask somebody who isn't Carissa, which he can totally do now, because magic. I've been practicing economic magic, Keltham says. Observe what I now do completely without a huge supply network to manufacture sound transmission equipment. He goes through the gestures to cast and catch message, then mouths to Merit's cell. Do her new clothes look very expensive? Yes, Merit's cell whispers back, smiling. Good news about Carissa's career trajectory, not such great news about the state of the rest of Cheliak's. You also seem more... generally cheerful, brighter, if I'm not just imagining things said to Carissa normally. You're very perceptive. It is generally said that you need to get multiple prettiness treatments if you want a man to actually notice instead of just vaguely feeling fonder. That is one of the other things I was going to tell you about later. Keltham peers at her more closely. That could be a change to underlying biology that I interpreted as cheerfulness, I suppose. If you hadn't told me, it wouldn't have occurred to me that your hidden background state appearance had changed. Oh, huh. Keltham has slightly mixed feelings about that, which he should put a pin into discussing some time later. Should he mention it now so she can help him pin it? A uh, no, that seems like an ominous and unspecified thing to dump on somebody if you're not going to talk about it right away. Keltham casts Detect Magic, just to see if he can spot any lingering magic on or about Carissa from it all. Nope. Have you eaten yet? I'm afraid we already did. I'll grab myself something and come right back then. He's about ready to wrap up. After this comes Keltham's casting his mysterious cleric spells for the day. Though Keltham isn't going to mention that fact until she's done eating dinner, in case it's otherwise a nice mood spoiler. Though she might not actually be in a nice mood, just prettier. Still, same logic applies. See you soon and again, he says, in a baseline idiom that maybe didn't quite translate to Taldane. She hurries out, smiling. More magnetic field-excluding practice. Also, more infinite additional questions. Is the limitation on irrigating more fields the limited supply of water, or the cost of infrastructure to transport water? What, if anything, do you already do to try to make fields have richer soil? You leave the fields fallow some years, says Tonya, and turn the soil deeper. In some places, they harvest bat shit from deep caves and the Underdark. Carissa requests a summary over dinner or anything that's come up, and also wonders aloud at security whether Asmodea's been behaving herself better or worse or the same. Keltham asked questions about farming and other aspects of Chelish economics. Meritzel and Tanya mostly answered them, in a way that fits the hypothetical new Cheliac so far as security could tell. Ioni passed a note to security offering to warn Keltham to maybe not trust everything Meritzel says about economics, because she might be overrunning her real knowledge in a very enthusiastic and well-intentioned way, but still. Security is deferring that decision to Sever. Ion oracled in one Ostenso library book about farmers, the security does still have the ability to redirect Keltham's thoughts away from text, and farming seemed innocuous. It didn't contain nearly as much direct detail on farming operations as Keltham had hoped. No illustrations of plows or mentions of how much a plow costs or who makes plows, and soon Keltham gave up and stopped reading. Keltham suggested establishing communications with somebody at the Ostenso Library, who could check through books first given a request for content and leave a found book in a designated place for Ioni to borrow. One sending is an improvement over two teleports or this potentially warrants a paired mirror. Security told him that requisitions said she'd think about it. Requisitions in this case really mean Sevar. They can get the mirrors if Sevar says yes. Asmodia has been keeping to her bedroom and rereading her math textbooks, which is overtly good behavior. She wasn't tightly monitored, but spot-checking of thoughts suggests that she's anxiously locking down a lot of disloyal thoughts. Nothing unusual for someone in her position, though, of course, Asmodia isn't being told that, but certainly more anxiety and thought suppression than would have been characteristic of her three days ago. Overt thoughts indicate willingness to work with Savar on her mysterious project for Dathilani thinking. 
confusion about what the real purpose of that is, painful hope that maybe she can avoid hell after all. Pilar was almost but not quite killed when a security wizard got a message announcing one of his wives had successfully birthed a child, and Pilar shouted congratulations from directly behind him. Nobody, including Pilar, understands how Pilar got into the temple room where the wizard was receiving the message, and Pilar can't quite remember what she was doing just before that. Pilar thinks she could possibly learn to not do it to on-duty security, so long as she can still do it sometimes to somebody, but on this occasion, the impulse took her by surprise. Pilar is significantly shaken up about this, because if she died like that, she wouldn't have been maledicted first. Also, Pilar needs to throw somebody a larger party, preferably a surprise party. Single pieces of cake being handed out on special occasions aren't going to cut it for her indefinitely. This is mostly Mayal's problem, but is being copied to Sivar in case it somehow interacts with project matters, or for that matter in case she wants to advise Mayal that having a chaotic good oracle to exhibit to Keltham isn't worth that much. Caden. Kylean is like the kind of god Carissa would have made up if she were a propagandist trying to convince Chelish people that good is stunningly worthless and stupid. Probably it's fine if Pilar throws some parties. How expensive can that even be, though the only acceptable targets for surprise parties are the other girls and maybe whoever's on staff doing laundry or whatever. Coordination with the library in Ostenso seems straightforwardly good for the cause of passing Keltham only desired books, worth a mirror. If Tanya and Meritzel are the chattiest girls, they should both get some training slash screening for how to handle it if Keltham wants to fuck them. Carissa heads back over once she's had enough to eat. There is no longer any staff on the premises doing laundry. All the usual slaves have been removed for now. They'd be infosec hazards to Keltham in any case. Cooking, janitorial, and other ops are being performed by a few first-circle priests of Asmodeus with appropriate civilian proficiencies. My gal is afraid that anyone here without a claimed soul is going to get oracled. If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash askwhocastsai. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059.